So here we have a link between a subjective experience, which is sorely lacking in our physical sciences, which is necessary. We have to understand Newtonian physics. Uh, you know, the world is 3D. Question, of course, is, um, in other words, are being, people seeing this world differently or, or in fact are seeing a different world? Is there indeed a different world that people are describing? Uh, and, you, and you can't falsify that and say conclusively that they're wrong. I, um, unfortunately, what we have is subjective experience. So what do we do with that? That still doesn't make, mean it's weak. It's mean that the scientific method is not adequately addressed to use the subjective experience as firm. Mm -hmm. Not firm, but highly suggestive evidence of whatever they say. Not clear cut firm conclusive evidence. No. But as plausible, even though uh, as something else that may have been mathematically derived. Yet, of course, it takes a, a much more secondary seat behind something that is mathematically derived and thus being considered as truth to physical reality. And welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's Luciano as your host here speaking. I want to thank you, the listener, for coming on uh, and joining us uh, again. And if you're a new listener, we hope you'll enjoy this and uh, many more to come. In fact, while you're waiting for the many more to come, you can listen to the many, uh, many more that we've already done. We've been having a lot of fun the last, uh, it's almost three years, closing in on three years, May 2020. And we feel like we're not even getting started yet. So uh, if, uh, if you are listening to this, please uh, do subscribe. Uh, do take the time and rate us. It always helps. And share with your family and friends. That's, uh, that's how we have been growing. It's been wonderful. We have, uh, we have listeners from all around the world. And uh, last note before we get into uh, our next guest here, if you feel so inclined to donate, we're a not-for-profit and a charity. Uh, we all do this uh, because we want to, uh, not because we're getting paid to do it. So all, uh, all donated funds go to the operations of the podcast. Please do so by going to simply our website, behindgreatness.org. And you can, you can find where you can donate there. So here we go. So today we're joined by Bob Davis. Uh, Bob Davis served as a professor for the State University of New York for over 30 years, where he conducted researcher, re, <clears throat> excuse me, research in the behavioral and neurosensory sciences. He's authored more than 60 scholarly papers and has presented numerous papers at national and international conferences included invited lectures at Harvard, Cambridge, and Peking University. He has published three books, The UFO Phenomenon, Should I Believe, Life After Death, An Analysis of the Evidence, and Unforeseen, or excuse me, Unseen Forces, The Integration of Science, Reality, and You. He's also decided to turn his book, Unseen Forces, into a documentary called The Consciousness Connection. This film explores the new frontiers of human experience and the enig enigmatic topic of consciousness. The documentary includes leading researchers from many disciplines and is designed to help bridge the gap between science and consciousness by integrating current experimental research and theories with life-changing personal accounts of extraordinary experiences reported by millions worldwide. You can, uh, you can visit and see the trailer as well at consciousnessfilm.info. And you can also visit uh, some of um, Robert's work. We're going to say Robert and Bob here interchangeably, obviously, at uh, his website, bobdavisspeaks.com. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. Bob, welcome to the program. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to chat up until now. Um, I expect no less in this one here. So why don't we get right into something here? Because uh, I read this recently in one of your papers. Explain, if you don't mind, elaborate what is meant by, uh, and you can provide any context you'd like, uh, by the brain featuring a quote-unquote God spot. Uh, there are a few neuroscientists that have theorized that we are innately conditioned for religiosity or spirituality, that there is another power like our ancestors who worshipped a deity beyond their physical apparently existence. 
And they, to, to try to prove or disprove it, they had conducted experiments um, on, on that from a neurological standpoint. And no, they have not, indeed, in my mind at least, uh, convincingly shows that there is a, a God, so-called God spot. Uh, we, are, we are trained, certainly, um, on faith-based uh, techniques and such, and, and belief systems that are strongly embedded. And we are a little more sensitive and responsive to themes in our environment associated with that. So you're going to see some heightened activity ascribed to those kinds of events, but we're not uh, innately, but we may be, you know, we may be. Uh, I'm not discounting that possibility that what we call transgenetic epi epigenetic inheritance, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, uh, allows for the distinct possibility that our prior experiences throughout our existence so manipulated the framework, the foundation, the genetic structure you know, that gives rise to the physiologic, physiologic mechanism. Um, and, and, and we are slaves to it in a sense. We have obvious instincts like survival as a result, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Uh, but we may also come back with spiritual beliefs. Some of us may have that deeply embedded more so than others where we are truth seekers. I just we I think what we can consider one who is considered spiritual, and we can become more or more uh, significant, more severe, dedicated. Whatever you want to say, truth seekers in a certain direction. Usually, it's metaphysical, uh, something about reality, life, you, consciousness, uh, religion. Certainly, let's just discount that and God, all the above, and then some. Life after death, this consciousness separate from the body. They're all interrelated coexisting comorbid questions that we've all addressed at some level on a personal and societal level and that we need to do more so of and i think we've lost a lot of that introspection on many of these important considerations so as your question posed is there a god spot it opens up an entire world of of other related issues because it brings in physiology religion my gosh, I have two disparate things in life, but we wrestle with that. The meaning of consciousness, the hard problem of defining consciousness. How do we code for sensation and, and love? Where is that in the brain? Is that coded in the brain? Uh, we can't describe it. It's ineffable. Language doesn't do it well. Maybe video language in terms of exchange does so but you can't describe the essence of the experience what it means to believe in god and have faith in god and benefit from that or anything else that may be mystical or horrific in nature um but we strive to understand what consciousness is and that's what the documentary is about as you mentioned at, at consciousnessfilm.info that I'm co-producing with Dave Beatty from Deep Dreamtime Entertainment and Wilson Hawthorne from Island, Island Telemedia, uh, trying to figure out, because no one knows, despite the fact that scholars from all disciplines have, have proposed theories and have debated about what is the essence of consciousness, reality, life itself, why are people experiencing alternate realms, encountering other beings and de deities, um, and feeling that they're exchanging information and it, with another reality? Men are benefiting it, benefiting through meditative practices, among other types of what maybe psychoactive practices too. But that so you see that in society now, there's a, a resurgence. I think of. Of, of the use of psychoactive drugs, oftentimes too much so, and to the wrong of certain people who should not be involved. But we, we see, why are people doing this? Why are, is UAP so um, meaningful to so many people, as it should be? As it should be. Near death and out of body experiences, uh, reincarnation, religion, certainly, um, among many others. Kundalini awakenings, uh, yoga, meditation, these alternative practices, often Eastern medicine based, not all. Why are people even going there and turning away from church, synagogue, 
etc. So let me interrupt here at this point, because uh, at one point, as I was reading through this article, and this article is called STE triggers, so spiritually transformative experience triggers. We can talk about that later as well, the definition. And thanks to your recommendation, we also have Yvonne Kaysan coming on the podcast as well. Um, but, so the interruption is this, um, because you mentioned Eastern medicine. And what I was reading is something that uh, has become very familiar for me as um, as an observation uh, with people that we've had on the podcast. And then in my own life, so there's also a second reason why I bring this up. Um, when we talk, so you hear, you discuss uh, thoughts and feelings and energies and enhanced emotions that people experience when they go through a spiritually transformative experience, so like an NDE or Kundalini or out of body experience and so forth. Uh, you say, you write, quote, it can leave one challenged with new insights that contradict many pre existing beliefs and concepts of life, which is uh, one of the reasons why we even have this podcast. Um, without an appropriate framework and support system to which they can turn. Many turn to spirituality as a buffer against the stress, likely to diagnose, uh, excuse me, uh, excuse me, by promoting positivity and resilience. And unfortunately, Western medicine is more likely to diagnose and treat a spiritual emergency as a psychological disorder with suppressive medication. I think... What the important thing there is, and you tell me um, if I'm off, it's because beliefs and concepts of life that are pre-existing have been seriously challenged by any of those experiences. Yes, indeed. Uh, and it is so extremely dissimilar to your, your foundation of what your concepts of life, reality, etc. is all about. That how can you not be? altered in some way, that many uh, psychologists best capture it by saying, and I tend to agree, there is some aspect of ego dissolution uh, that can even be accompanied by a decrease in the default uh, network, uh, mode network of the brain, which results in greater connectivity among other aspects of the brain. So when people have these, as you mentioned, spiritually transformative experiences, a term that Ivan Kassan, who coined that, you're going to have her on as a guest soon, I, and I, I should be a wonderful, um, wonderful conversationalist with your audience to, to mm -hmm. discuss this in, in greater detail. She's experienced Kundalini near that than not experience. I've experienced Kundalini as well. Um, but I understand that there is both a, a conscious space and physiologic space aspect to it. And, and that seems to be associated with many of these types that trigger events that are indescribable, but that leaves one in, in a state of spiritual emergency. Mm. Um, their perspective of it, their experiences, of course, are so, again, extremely dissimilar to what they understand life to be all about, that how can they not experience some negative interpretation in the form of what happened to me? Why me? What does it mean? What's it all about? The obvious questions. And that's anxiety provoking. How can it not be? Many people need some medical support, psychological support, and hopefully it's appropriate in nature because they can certainly be in a, this state of crisis that is deserving of serious attention. And counseling, yes, indeed, over time to incorporate what the experience meant to them. So here's here's my second interruption with a question, uh, or maybe a comment with a question. Then, uh, because you you just said anxiety provoking, uh, we've had uh, um, folks on the uh, on this podcast who have had uh, out of body experiences, uh, musicians, uh, um, uh, medical professionals, artists uh, who've had near death experiences, and I I get the provoking of anxiety. This is where I I am I am at a I am I am personally speaking I don't enjoy being confused but I'm excited by being confused I don't believe that anybody has the answers but 
I continue to have fun searching for them. Um, and that's what I'm finding with a lot of our guests. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons why we have, we've had you on the program. So turning to a spirituality. So you, you're now provoked with some anxiety because uh, even in your experience, when you had your Kundalini, I'm going to ask you about that in a few minutes too. You said it left you with some spiritual anxiety. And what I find with the spirituality movement, generally speaking, is that it provides like positivity and resilience as the end game. Uh, I find, uh, and I, I'm even referring to friends of mine and people I know personally, uh, who find um, an enlightened path, enlightened way. Uh, and I believe that they believe that they are living one and having one. I don't doubt it. But it, it, sometimes it feels like it is the end to the game. And I feel that that's shortchanging us. I think confusion is where we need to be. I think we need to feel, I'm not, I'm not speaking from high above, yeah, yeah. Eh? but I, I think we need to stay yeah, and not yeah, be afraid yeah, of being yeah, confused. Yeah, but, but, Sorry, go ahead. You're, you're, I, I get it. You like the chase. You like skiing down the mountains, the drag getting to the finish line. It's all over. The nine innings, innings are up, signing game. Now I got to take the cross Fox Expressway home. Um, <laughs> I like to be, like to be, um, it's entertaining. To me, it's a hobby. So what do I do now in retirement? I do, I do a film. So I need to be confused. I need to, I, I understand it's completely, you, you capture it, you capture it so, so beautifully in, in a sense that I, I, I get what you are saying because I've been there. And in order to be there, you have to have some insights or experience with it. Um, we're excited by being confused, as you say, and I and I. It's a good way to look at it um, because it's challenging. That excitement uh, is can be blissful as long as it's not too excited and too. And because some people take it to the nth degree and and fall into that extreme new new age uh kind of mode uh and it's fine if they're if it does them good i'm not knocking it in any way but but it doesn't mean that 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 you know then i wouldn't go with it for truth in that direction for the average for the average individual you know look at look at science look at look that well-established uh podcasts too few and far between like yours who has uh, the true intellectuals on in various disciplines and and thus you have a unique selection of intellectuals and experiences and, and who and and you can be in a better position to make up your own mind because no one has the answers at best at best when we talk about parapsychology near death and all the topic areas we're kind of getting into where where our film my film is gets involved with the people scientists academicians experience who are involved in it well it allows me for a path to continue confusion to continue my research for seeking the truth uh, in a different way than my 30 years as a you know, neuroscience re researcher it, 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 it provided all these years. I feel free, no stigma anymore. I can flap my wings and, and have more flexibility, willingness, especially as an experiencer at some mm -hmm. level. Uh, and that's more than a motivating factor for me talking to you, for me writing these books. Uh, and doing a film. Otherwise, I, I would be, well, I'm not a golfer, but more likely be playing fishing like the average retire, retiree down in sunny Southwest California. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm just the uh, complete opposite. And that's cool because, as you say, I need to be confused. That's cool. It's fun. Um, you know, that sense of mystery. We don't have the answer. And I like the speculation, the game trying to get to the answer because that rabbit hole, and you can't put the cork back into the bottle once it comes out. You try to suppress it. You can for a while. Good luck. Uh, it won't last too long. But it's okay. Go with it. Have fun with it. Embrace it. And that's, and that's the whole thing with having these unique experiences, you turn on to the, an issue of reality that you never really considered with such 
fierce determination where you internalize it to the point where life revolves around that more than you revolve or more than the world revolves around you. In other words, you, know, you revolve around that uh, less egoic. And, and that's not a secret. It's not a, it's in turn, and again, as I mentioned, it's a physiologic counterpart to that or consequence associated with ego dissolution. Again, decrease in, in the default mode network of the brain. Uh, and there are other neurologic symptoms in the brain associated with that that seem to be beneficial. So here we have a link between a subjective experience, which is sorely lacking in our physical sciences, which is necessary. We have to understand Newtonian physics. Uh, you know, the world is 3D. question, of course, is, in other words, are peeing, people seeing this world differently or, or, in fact, are seeing a different world? Is there indeed a different world that people are describing? Uh, and you and you can't falsify that and say conclusively that they're wrong. Um, unfortunately, what we have is subjective experience. So what do we do with that? That still doesn't make, mean it's weak. It's mean that the scientific method is not adequately addressed to use the subjective experience as firm. Mm -hmm. Not firm, but highly suggestive evidence of whatever they say. Not clear cut from conclusive evidence no but as plausible even though uh, as something else that may have been mathematically derived yet of course it takes a, a much more secondary seat behind something that is mathematically derived and thus being considered as truth to physical reality sorry i want to jump in here on subjective experience just picking up uh, uh, on the phrase We've had Pim Van Lommel here uh, as well on the podcast. He's a retired cardiologist, also a near-death experience uh, researcher. Uh, and also Stephen Dick, who was uh, until recently the chief historian, uh, astrobiologist, astronomer, uh, chief historian for NASA. Um, uh, Pim Van Lommel talked about subjective experiences uh, being part of the scientific study and how we need to accept that. And, uh, and we're hearing that more and more from, from people who are coming on. Uh, Stephen Dick, who, uh, with whom we've had a, we had a great conversation um, just a short little while ago, um, st uh, stopped at uh, exploring any discussion on a subjective experience. And uh, admittedly, he's never had one. So we couldn't have a conversation on the importance of subjective experience. Um, it's important. I think it's important for the listener to know your background, speaking of uh, experiencing uh, a quick, <laughs> quick background. I mean, you, you, grew up, you grew up in a very material world, so to speak. So you, you grew up in the Bronx, across the street from Yankee Stadium. Uh, you're a, a baseball, a baseball file. <laughs> <laughs> if I could say that. Um, that was your world. It, it was abnormal if you didn't if you didn't go watch Mickey Mantle, uh, and, and if you didn't uh, play up uh, play uh, across from Yankee Stadium. So that was your world. And then you said um, you turned on the afterburners in college, and you start to receive some confidence from other PhD in neurosciences, and then you went down that path. So you went down. I, again, I'm I'm glossing over here, but you went down a, a material path, a, a scientific study, rigorous scientific academic study, uh, for three decades. Um, what happened? Where where was the trigger? Where was the change? Where was the shift? Where was the metamorphosis? I had three experiences. Each one led to a book. Collectively, they led me. Each here. one led to you writing a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, indeed. But even in prior to that, I, I've always had an open mind, even though I followed the scientific method as best as I possibly can and and ascribe to that. I've learned about it. I applied that. Uh, and it has a place, indeed. So, um, however, when I had one experience, a, in other words, which occurred in Sedona, Arizona in 2012, my wife and I were walking one night, observing a nice guy, and I happened to see an, an orange glowing orb, 
<laughs> a few miles away, five feet or so up in the air, stationary but distinct, enough so that it got my attention. Um, so I kept observing it. And as I did, for a short period of time, a second one slowly emerged from either from behind it or with, with, from within it, hard to, hard to know. And they were exactly the same, two small orange suns. I couldn't, I couldn't estimate their size. I'm not good at that. But they weren't small if it was still visible to me, but still small, but still behaving in, in unique ways. I thought of geomagnetic, geothermal. How am I supposed to figure it out? So it's unidentified. Doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. It's, it don't let's not jump to that conclusion. Certainly, uh, but nevertheless, it was mo it was unique because they suddenly winked out. So here, here we have two two events uh, in a sense where they separate, they remain stationary, they appear, they disappear. Uh, it leaves you an impression, and uh, and given my prior interest in. UFOs, which we now call unidentified anomalous phenomena, according to the arrow of, of, of the DOD. Given that interest, I decided to write, in a sense, a, a book about that topic, as if it was a, an intro one on one book. Uh, but adding my two cents worth along the way, not, not saying I have any answer, but here are the theories, go, here's the data, the systematic review, go figure it out. But my writing is kind of academic in nature. I try to make it friendly. So I don't know how, how but so it's written a little bit more for the college uh, college readers. But nevertheless, it's, it's uh, then, however, given that, about two years later, I had another experience, which got my attention. Uh, I had a lucid dream. It felt as if I was suffocating. I, I, I never felt a fear as significant as this. I felt as if I couldn't breathe, truly as if I was dying. Of course, it woke me up, left me with more than an impression and a knowingness that my colleague in the lab, who I'd worked with for many years and was very close with, had died. And surprisingly, and not so surprisingly, you know what I'm going to say. I learned to find that she did die that, that morning at around that time. And it, it hit me very shortly thereafter when I connected the two. Hearing the confirmation of it just gave me grief. But then I, I thought about my personal experience, the subjective, with this, this other information. And, and, and then I combined it and I said, oh, my gosh, that's not a, that's not a coincidence. I never had a lucid dream, let alone about something like that, let alone at about the same time that my close, a close soulmate, whatever you want to call it, friend and colleague, um, <laughs> passed away. I mean, you, can't, you can't figure that out statistically other than to say it's impossible. It's impossible for, for that to be coincidental. It's impossible. I don't care if you're, you're an astrophysicist in Harvard for 50 years and you wrote 17 books. Fuck you, it's impossible. I don't care what you say <laughs> or what theory you propose, saying that it is possible to happen by chance. And, and that's, how, that's how significant it is to people who are experiencers. It's real than real. And, and they can't. That's why they often don't want to talk about it because they're, fear, they're, they're afraid of getting any ridicule from others about it because they know it's truth to them. And they feel the need to spread the word. So that was 2014. So then I wrote the book, Life After Death, after that experience and analysis of the evidence. I looked at it more academically. What are all the topics that address consciousness as something different than the body and can exist after bodily death? The ultimate question of consciousness. We've all asked that instinctively. Survival of the essence in our genes, as we obviously mentioned earlier, we know that, and thus we, we ask the questions. We're threatened by it at one level or another. Uh, and, uh, and sorry, what do you believe? What do you believe happens to you then? Uh, I, I, I believe that there is strong, very strong suggestive evidence 
that there is that consciousness is distinctly different than than the body. And and I the only way I know for sure my experiences have helped me believe that more so than I was I was always 50-50. And that's why I want to believe I don't, you know, whatever. I <laughs> some you know, faith input there. Mm-hmm. That I, but but after my experiences, like like the lucid dream I just described, you can't help be more to the right in the sense of the camp, believing that you know there's something to this, the distinction of consciousness, and 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 we don't have a definition of what that is. It's very loosely termed discipline specific, of course. It's, it could be propofol in your veins from an anesthesiologist. Uh, to something philosophical or metaphysical in nature, to a near-death experience, experience in an alternate reality. Whatever it is, uh, it, it has that spiritually transformative effect. And also that I had to write that book and address these topic areas of reincarnation, near-death and out-of-body experiences, quantum physics, theories on consciousness. So I can learn from that and also help teach others by integrating all that complex information I find fascinating and in parapsychology as well. A lot of scientific work done by a lot of, lot of intellectual, many of whom you've had on this show, like Dean Radin, and who will be, who will be in our documentary mm-hmm. on co- at consciousnessfilm.info, a list of, again, participants, many scientists and experienced will, will be there. Um, you have had Diane Hennessy as well, yep. I believe, on that yep. show, um, and she'll be in our film. Raymond Moody, not uh, Moody, and uh, not Moody. Uh, Jeff, not Jeff Long. Jeff Long and uh, the one at the University, Grayson, Bruce Grayson. Oh, Bruce Grayson, yeah, yeah. Going to the International Association of Native Studies in, mm-hmm. in, in the end of August and interview them, as well as Gary Nolan. A Stanford professor is doing research in on the brain and experiences and and material that some people claim may may potentially be extraterrestrial in nature. Anyway, again, that's getting a little off the topic. So we're going to have Gary Nolan on, and we learned about him through Dan Pasolka's book too. But there is something that I caught in. Sorry, I, I'm interrupting here, but I I, no, I think no, it's please. perfect that you said that. Um. Because yes, he 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 claims that he has material that is uh, I forget the exact wording he's used, but is not human. Um, there is meta material, uh, meta material. Yeah, I don't I don't remember, uh, but I'll have him on and he'll he'll straighten that out. Uh, but in in some of your writing, um, and specifically what you wrote uh, for free, the research was suggesting. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that it's all interrelated, uh, physical uh, UAP experiences versus the experiences you might have in dreams or OBEs are, are possibly connected. Gary does talk about uh, recovering, receiving material that are recovered and that strangely are composed of maybe a meta material with the composition um, radio the isotopes are arranged slightly differently you know we are familiar with the, with the isotopes but there's this unique composition uh is there a code there at, at one level another piece of material he, he receives and has to do an analyze and and, and he may i don't want to steal some of the show and and, and he's talking about it he has talked about it maybe something like that is composed of lead which is very unusual, but we're familiar with this with this compound. Uh, there may be a tweak, a, a mild, a mild uh, little tweak in it that's unusual. However, as if a game is being played, and why would we find such a, a, a material out in in this field? It, it, it's not that the composition is strange; it's the associated <laughs> surroundings. If you want, you know, the question of makes no sense for this material to be here the way it is based on their analysis of the situation not certainly not mine hmm. um enough so that that he raises it um and it's pure purity 
is is surprising, unusual. So so it's those kind of factors in combination, like the people who claim, getting back to the free uh, study that you mentioned, I was part of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell's Research Foundation with many scientists, and it drew me to that after I wrote my book, UFO, UFO Phenomena. And when they heard me speak about it, they invited me to be on that. And I was like a kid in a candy shop. I had so much data to play around with. And I had the subjective information as well. As, and, and wonderful people to interact with, uh, many uh, noted uh, scholars and, and non academicians it, it was just a nice, divisive group of, of folk, many experiences. And uh, I was at a very mild level. I saw two iron drugs, but I, I didn't have that lucid dream, nor did I have that Kundalini experience. Eventually, uh, I and Russ Galpone, an experimental psychologist and, and research analyst, uh, published that article uh, in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, Exploration. And I know you read that back in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was truly proud of that because we have a scholarly journal and a, and a serious refereed journal. Uh, and we went through that editorial review process. I was stringent. So I'm very familiar with that, given my, my publisher parish career. Um, and then it, when, it, when it was finally accepted i thought that was uh, something to brag about because of not I, I, i'm familiar with doing the methodology and i had wonderful collaboration and and writing it up but the fact it's a topic matter itself that more or less was being accepted in in a scientific referee journal and they have received such types of uh, experiments but not uh, that are kind of fringe science, let's say, parapsychology, says, but I'm not familiar with, with anything in U, UFOs. And that's what's sorely lacking in, in this field. And well, more let, we will, yeah. Let's read out the, the title of that article. So people, it's, it's, it was called, this is 2018, a study on reported contact with non-human intelligence associated with unidentified aerial phenomena. So that is what you wrote mm -hmm. with, uh, with three others. Uh, uh, Rudy Shield, Russell Scalpone, as you mentioned, and Ray Hernandez. So this is what was it, so it, this was what was published um, through free. And uh, for the listener, for, especially for the new listener, because we've been talking about it recently. Free stands uh, stood for because they changed names. The Dr. Edgar Mitchell Research uh, Foundation, Experience for Research Foundation. Yeah, the uh, Foundation for Research of Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Encounters. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And we had scientists like you, uh, astrophysicists like uh, uh, Rudy Shield, and many other scientists involved in large data capture and study of this. Um, not learned in science classes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unfortunately, and, and I call for that need to for to be more uh, integrated in, in academia at some level, uh, as well as parapsychology, and and how we should address the the UFO UAP problem and the governance structure involved. I was I was fantasizing a little, using some of my governance background in academia and integrating that with the both the strengths and limitations as I perceived it in ufology and, and organizations at that time, although I commend their efforts greatly for their desire to find the underlying truth. And this we're only scratching the surface surface at best. Nevertheless, their their search is, is commendable. And more organizations, both public and private, are doing so as a result of the 2017 incidents. Uh, so my book is obsolete in that regards. This was published in 2015. Uh, nevertheless, it's a, more of a historical text. And, and I'm thrilled. That's what I'm getting at, really. Thrilled, thrilled to see that just the other day there's hearings uh, at, at the, and congressional hearings on the UAP topic. The fact that they're sitting down discussing it, that they have an office uh, arrow that within the Department of Defense, they have a budget limited in nature, but they have some money to expand. The scientists involved, there are other, you know, there's even. Uh, 
Uh, it's a start. It's, it's a start, in, and there's many other offshoots of that that uh, agency. It is a start, yeah. at least for starting and scratching the surface at that level. But likely there are, there are many uh, unacknowledged special access programs. Would not be surprised, at least. You never know. Uh, at least that's what you hear. But you have to be very careful buying into any of these obvious uh, misinformation campaigns and, and, mm, and yeah. uh, false data. So Always it's, it's hard to be misweighed, dissuaded within the field. Um, Let me ask you another question. Let me ask you another bomb. Um, so you, the first time we spoke, um, or early on in one of our conversations, you said your mornings, <coughs> excuse me, you, you were a workaholic uh, when you were doing your research uh, 30 years at the university. Uh, you said um, you worked on high functioning anxiety, that you had uh, an objective in mind and uh, often went overboard to accomplish accomplish it took you know the typical your, your typical workaholic stuff you took priority over his health over your health you're overstressed over work didn't have the right attitude type a approach you're kind of that guy if you had one of those three experiences so the the um the uh, viewing of the orb uh, your shared death experience or the kundalini experience during those 30 years of your high functioning anxiety anxiety days what what do you think knowing you what would you have changed would something have happened of those three experiences i would like to have uh, had the kundalini experience over the other two okay okay so you're do. no you're you're answering another question <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because that's I, a future question um, which one you'd like to change if yeah but if you had those experiences uh, any one of those experiences while you were your type A personality in the, the 30 years of research? Yeah, it would be the Kundalini because I was so anxiety provoking. So that would have put me a little over the edge, uh, uh, given my natural state in general. Yeah, I've, indeed. I, I, I wake up in the morning, uh, run downstairs, cup of coffee, uh, some uh, highly processed crap to eat, uh, and uh, we're out the door and I'm doing research as uh, quickly as I can. Um, and that's a high functioning anxiety. So you, you, it, it's beneficial professionally uh, in, in several ways, but it's there is a trade off in terms of it is stress and, and the reduction of pleasurable uh, experiences in life. And and when I retired, I, I adopted much of the same kind of uh, attitude where I'd wake up, start writing the book. And it was gung, gung ho. That was the main mission uh, and uh, very focused, narrow view of reality that was altered considerably by, by these kinds of experiences. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't want that again. The let that be more in retirement as, as it was. And that was a culminating experience, that incredible realization that your body is doing something that your mind is distinctly aware of and still in control. In other words, I was experiencing bliss, yet I was, my body was contorting involuntarily. Being, I, and I can't even um, describe it, but it was under a, another type of influence, either from, from the body itself that I couldn't control or externally. I couldn't describe it because someone who was a medium was actually channeling, supposedly, as she's described, uh, someone else, another power, into my body. And, and it wasn't hypnosis, at least as far as I can, can be concerned. And all of a sudden, I had such a pronounced effect, extraordinary pleasurable, yet if anybody observed me, on the video, which I happen to have, they would think I'm, I'm in extreme pain or torture. It looks like I'm crying, sobbing. And, and one can interpret it in many different ways. And I continue to interpret it because it was so confusing and in, impactful in ways that are deeply personal, psychological, spiritual, if you want to use that term. So you're in need of help. You need to discuss it, yet you're afraid to discuss it. Who are you going to share it with? What it all meant? I even talk about it. Someone can't relate to that. Yeah. You, you can't. You can't attach to what I'm just saying. I can't. I can't use any language. Interconnectedness. I'll say that. 
you know, I, 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 I have another understanding, <clears throat> another realization of connectedness with reality. And I, I can't uh, come up with another word. In terms of pleasure, bliss to me seems to be the best way to describe, capture the feeling I had. I had confusion, intense, because my body is contorted in extreme ways head one way, body the other way, and I had no control of it. I wasn't afraid of it, but it, it was kind of like you getting back to what you say, it it it, 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 it the anxiety was provoking. You needed to be confused. Um it it was enlightening in a way um in an, in and of itself. So there's some excitement, some joy that you attach to it, but also fear, no question about it, because the next day in Sydney, Australia, with the, with the need to take a flight back home to um, where I live in Florida, was something that you did not want to do, it, post having a kundalini. And I had all the, the, the symptoms of a kundalini experience, especially when there's energetic effects. Let's be clear about this. To the clearest thing, which is kundalini from other states of mind or alterations of consciousness that some people proclaim. And we have to be careful because the influence of imagination can be significant and, and be misleading to one believe that they're having an out-of-body experience or for reincarnation, um, that kind of thing, a communication with some other non-human entity. So we have to be careful. Or a brain glitch that we, we cannot explain or understand, given our limited knowledge of brain function at this time. So, yeah. What is God? I feel like I need to ask you this. What, what does God mean to you? Um, nothing. It means it means uh, it's something that uh, provides a, a, a theme to address in a spiritual way. And I like the confusion associated with it. Getting back to you know, I need to be confused, and there's a question mark. So I'm always I've been in the visit, business of trying to figure out. Will solve hypotheses, prove or disprove the null hypothesis in science. Well, we got one here in God. I, I can't be successful, but one day after sitting sitting down in Burger King, having a cup of terrible coffee, um, I hope they don't sue me. Uh, I see somebody. No, somebody. No, it, somebody with a, a collar comes over to me. And he asked me, would you mind to sit? And he starts talking to me. And I, it was right after I read, wrote my book, Life After Death. So I started to talk to him about it. Associated with that discussion, he opened up a little and told me how, how he used to be an alcoholic. And then he had the experience of, of falling on his knees, begging to God, crying for an answer to save him and all of a sudden a, a being of light and i've heard this before hmm. appeared to him in front of him he, he didn't see it as he said distinctly with the face a clear distinct face etc but he again at that sense of knowing this he knew it was christ he felt it uh, love etc and he was given the task of preaching that love etc to the world. Uh, and he gave him a purpose to become a minister. And, and he did. And in a sense, he felt chosen. So said, that's, that's why I'm wearing a collar. Uh, I felt that, was, you know, it's so, that kind of evidence. Now, is he insane? You know, even if he was considered insane by the leading psychiatrist in the world, I don't care. To me, that's still reality. Why? Because as long as he's doing an extraordinarily good job, having a pronouncedly positive effect on the lives of others, hmm. that's all that. That's a true reality to me. As as true as a formula on a piece of paper, you know. But it's subjective. It's subjective. Look at that. So in my mind, it's how we perceive reality. Thus, 
what we consider to be truth. And there's many different types of truth, scientific truth, spiritual. There's no, there's no maybe ultimate truth. What is God to me? Is there an ultimate truth? Or are we avatars being played by, you know, by something like this? I used to say to my wife, there's something doing this to me. I don't know what, angelic, non-human, whatever you want to call it, a higher power, or your, your higher self, some people describe it. It could be your, I don't know, young try, Freud try to get at it, maybe your alter ego. Maybe there there are these aspects of mind we're not familiar with. Sure. Maybe th- there is this higher power where we somehow get into this cognitive state of mind where, uh, where enhanced consciousness in, is achieved, where we have uh, abilities of, of extrasensory perception, more attuned to the ecology of the world and people. Um, we, we have empathy, sympath- more sympathetic, or more humane overall. We see that people who have these types of experiences tend to have these personal outcomes that are generally more positive in nature. And that's reality to me. That is what we should consider the the subjective experience that is is on par with any aspect of our understanding of a physical law in Newtonian physics. Especially since quantum mechanics alone is as enigmatic as one can ever be. You you can look at quantum mechanics and say this is an aspect of um, a, a science that that is more paranormal than anything else. Uh, it, it, so uh, once you begin to understand certain elements of it, so uh, it, it helps bridge the gap between science and some of the kinds of anomalous anomalous experience people are, are describing, and what this film is trying to capture. And that's why we ask, uh, kind of sheepishly, as producers, if you feel what you've heard it resonates with you at any level, feel free, especially uh, if you have, <laughs> I say this kiddingly, but not so kiddingly, wishing to invest uh, anything uh, towards the film, or um, or if you have a few months to live in deep pockets and don't know what to do with it, maybe maybe I'm talking to one in, in, in 20 million here, you get lucky and, and we both each do it. <laughs> one another a tremendous favor in one, one way. Uh, I could say that again, sheepishly and shyishly, but as a producer, this is what one does, so, and I apologize uh, by, by doing so. Nevertheless, oh, getting, back, getting back to the discussion. Well, so the, the, the discussion, I, I wanted to say this, your work on your books, um, your work on what you did for free, um, your work on the papers that you still write, <laughs> excuse me, and I presume, of course, uh, translated into your film, to use your words here early on in conversation, y- you are, s- I guess, celebrating and also trying to discover what you really believe as w- um, what people have been experiencing as realer than real. I like that because you said that earlier. <laughs> that's that's yeah. that's a that's a guy that's a guy from the Bronx. Who's kept it real? <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. You should say with the Bronx dialect too for emphasis. You know? That's it. Like, <laughs> like in the film, the the Bronx Tale with the Robert De Niro. One of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> I relate. So I've eaten pizza on that block. No kidding. Uh, Oh my gosh! Uh, the Yankees, uh, Joe Girardi, the manager, used to go go there all the time for pizza at the Half Moon, right on the corner. Wow! Of, um, oh, great neighborhood. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, but that was you. You'd like it. <laughs> no, I I know I would. Um, one last question before we uh, before we part ways here. What uh, what is greatness to you? That that can only be defined subjectively. Greatness is the criteria for greatness is unique to all skills. Either hitting a ball consistently to four hundred feet, uh, better than anybody, uh, to to playing um, something beautifully, melodically, to structuring words that are also melodic and unique and insightful beyond anyone's belief uh, to to those in science 
maybe uh, stick their um, neck out a little and 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 go against the grain, you know, like uh, Abby Loeb, looking at the possibility of extraterrestrial um, uh, signatures that may have arrived here. The Gal and sponsoring, helping to fund the Galileo project, and, and Gary Nolan stepping out of the box, a professor at Stanford University, looking at alternative what the mainstream science considers alternative fringe science, and there are other scientists like him, uh, many again who are in that documentary, but are doing very worthwhile things, and and others should be more involved with this. That's greatness in that area, I think. I think there should be greater emphasis in that area to have more scholars and people involved and just nevertheless to, to understand what life is all about for the betterment of at the personal and societal level. Um, and then you have greatness in other disciplines, of course. So it, it's a matter of prioritizing which ones you think um, should should deserve more funding, more accountability, more seriousness. And it, it comes at all levels. Um, uh, some people look at what I did and say, it's amazing, the professor, uh, and you're still writing articles, still writing books. Uh, that's greatness. And I said, no, no, that's not, that's not greatness. But I've heard that enough. So, and, and, and my wife says, you know, kind of getting at what she's what she's trying to reach in me is, does that do anything for you, hearing that? And I say, no, not at all. Uh, I, I don't even feel that because it comes naturally. Uh, that's just me. And, and I've heard a lot of other people where that may, may be perceived as, uh, wow, uh, embellished, in other words, where the participants involved internally may consider it horrendous or something they don't want. It's like someone who, who experiences one of these things, near death, UAP, or interacts with whatever, an alternate reality, and they often say, initially, they wish they didn't have the experience. They don't want to identify with it. And, and then, over time, they'll integrate it, but they do need proper support to do so. So, um, it's a good question. It's relative, it's subjective, in terms of trying to understand what it is and how you should perceive it is maybe something very different than the way another person perceives the same thing. Well, um, my, my quick observation on what you said is how you started the answer. Um, you used sport, you use music, you use writing, and then, uh, scientific exploration as, um, as definitions uh, plugging into what you were figuring out uh, greatness to be. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no. I'm, in a sense, I'm prioritizing. <laughs> You're prioritizing. This kid from the Bronx watching Mantle hit, hit another home run well over 400 <laughs> feet. <laughs> Great, greatness, you know. He's playing he beyond that said, fringe. He was considered the greatest, you know, when he, he the go. greatest team, the greatest teammate. That, but that adjective is used. <laughs> I like that question. You can like leave you, the Bronx, but the Bronx can't leave you. Eh? <laughs> listen, you know, it, uh, it, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I probably sounded too. Um, and by the way, just uh, if I may say, I I consistently get really turned on by your podcast. The job you do, if I may say, in closing, um, is truly at the at the top of of those that I've listened to, because because not only are your questions very well studied and thus insightful. And, and if I may emphasize to the audience that you, you at least with me, I suspect you do with all your guests, do conduct a pre-interview. So you truly understand who you're talking to. And you see by doing so, you conduct a pre-interview a week or so beforehand. So, and, and that was a wonderful conversation that I had with you. I agree. Uh, and that allowed me to get to know you better and, and certainly in reverse. And, and, and we both use it for, 
this discussion and and to to and I the point is I see it come through in your your prior discussions you, you see and I said to myself this guy is really good and then I started listening more after you mentioned it to me I truly wasn't aware of it I'm being you know being honest with you and I wish I had been but however it allows me to go back and I have your collection going way back my gosh what a library you have but <laughs> and it's in well, i'm getting it's all in all different disciplines uh top-notch people um uh, and uh, very entertaining intellectually stimulating and and insightful on your part and i and tell your friends everybody and i'm not just saying that if, if people in this area uh, you know if you know people in this area and not everybody likes this stuff but it's beautiful what you do keep it up thank you, thank you. Well. i didn't expect that it was uh, very nice of you i appreciate that bob uh, a pleasure and uh, i look forward to more Please, uh, please have me back. I look forward to our friendship in the future. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you, Bob. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and share with your friends. And consider donating to help us produce more great conversations at behindgreatness.org slash donate. Until next time. <laughs>